very warm welcome to CNBC Africa's special broadcast of the Monetary Policy Committee meeting in Nigeria. We're wishing you from Lagos. Welcome, I am Wale Famrewa. Thank you for joining us. All right, today is, is a very unusual meeting. Um, this meeting is coming under very unusual circumstances. As I mentioned, the MPC will meet for a single day instead of its usual two-day meeting as the committee works to align with the rules or of the Presidential Tax Force on COVID-19. But so much has changed since the last meeting in March, where the committee decided by unanimous vote to retain the emergency policy rate at 13.5% and to hold all other policy parameters unchanged. Since that meeting, when the number of confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Nigeria was at 42, the confirmed COVID-19 cases in Nigeria has risen to 8,733 today. As we await the decision of the MPC, Bismarck Rwani, the CEO of Financial Derivatives, and Muda Yusuf, Director General of the Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry, are my guests to preview the MPC's decision. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, Bismarck, I'd like to start with you. We always like to start with your expectations. So tell us, what do you anticipate the MPC will, will, will tell us and, of course, ultimately do today? Um, the NPC, I expect them to tell you about the risks, the downside risks to actually reducing interest rates, and also to tell you the risks of tightening at this time, which is the usual um, process they go through. But in the end, I expect them to maintain the status quo because um, Nigeria faces a stagflation scenario whereby you have high inflation and negative growth in the second quarter. Don't forget that. The first quarter result and report that you just got ended March 31st, but the lockdown started April 2nd. So, technically speaking, we're in the quarter, and I, if you look at what happened in the GDP numbers, many, you know, only nine of the areas of the activities were outperformed the GDP. The bulk of the activities were in negative, uh, performed negatively. So, I do not expect any change at this point in time. Right. But Ms. Mark, if I can stay with you on that point about why you think that they will hold the rates unchanged. If we look across the world, um, given the economic slowdown, the, 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 the default um, reaction of monetary policy um, authorities is to ease. And I just wanted to get your thoughts about why you think that perhaps is not something they will be thinking of. And if not, shouldn't they? No, under normal circumstances, if your inflation rate was about 3 or 4%, and you eased and you printed money more or less, then the, ups, the upside risk of inflation will go from, say, 3, 4 to 5 or 6. But that way you would have saved livelihoods, saved, saved lives, and saved jobs. But in this case, we are already at 12.36, and that is April. By the time you get to the May level, when the pass through effect of the exchange rate adjustment that has taken place begins to hit under onto prices. You'll find that, technically speaking, if you do anything, you might actually push inflation into a very into a level which will, which will threaten job and threaten growth. So I think the, the right thing and the prudent thing to do is to maintain the status quo while you view things and take, take a decision as to, I think, the next meeting. Then you can now begin to say, okay, now I can tighten. Because the only way you have to do because you have excess liquidity, you have money supply saturation, and you also are holding about 9.2 trillion naira in C uh, CRR uh, funds of the banks. So I cannot see how they can do that without putting more pressure on the exchange rate. As you know, the parallel market is trading at about 465. The I&E window is trading at about 390. And if non deliverable forwards has gone as high as 500. So we have a tricky situation with the exchange rate. Um, the reserves uh, have increased because we paid in the IMF uh, drawdown there, but we still have, we have problems in terms of our current account uh, uh, balance of trade, terms of trade, and current account. All right. Okay, so what I hear you saying is that it's the concerns around inflation and, of course, um, pressure on the currency. We'll hear more about that later on, but let me move over to Muda and get your perspective. Muda, um, as the COVID-19 pandemic began to unravel here in Nigeria, we saw the central bank um, step out with uh, rolling out in, a number of programs to support corporate Nigeria. 
I want to start with that and hear your thoughts on potentially the impact that we have seen so far and the impact that you're anticipating moving forward um, of the central bank's moves to support um, the private sector as they deal with the pandemic. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let me also uh, to the line of uh, Bismarck. I don't expect uh, any change in terms of the policy stance of the central bank at this time. Uh, just as he said, it's a dilemma. It's a, it's a dilemma that uh, a stagflation phenomenon presents. You have a stagnating economy, and you also have uh, inflationary pressures. You have pressure on the exchange rates. And knowing the central bank and the disposition of the central bank, I uh, see the central bank prioritizing protection of the exchange rates and inflation over the issue of, uh, of promoting growth. So to that extent, I, I see CBN not taking any uh, steps towards either easing the current uh, situation uh, as it is. But talking about what the CBN has done, of course, uh, we have seen some intervention in terms of facility moratorium and all of that. Uh, that is a welcome development, although the impact is yet to begin to manifest. And secondly, there is a concern that a bigger issue with many private sector players has to do with the credit, uh, the indebtedness of commercial banks. What the CBN announced has to do a lot more with the CBN's own direct facility, you know, the reduction in interest and the moratorium. But the bigger challenge for many players in the economy has to do a lot more with uh, their indebtedness to the commercial banks. And uh, as we speak, there's been no system-wide pronouncement as to what kind of policies or what kind of concessions the banks will give. I know banks have been asking customers to come forward on one-on-one -on -one, uh, case and all of that. But what we want to see uh, in the private sector is something that is kind of intervention, something like an economic or system-wide pronouncement uh, to give reprieve to all those who are indebted to the, to the commercial banks. As at the end of 2019, I think credit as time to the commercial banks was about 15 trillion. That's a whole lot. And given the fact that many businesses in the last two months have not been doing anything practically, and some of them have been running a lot of costs, some of them are running some high and fixed costs and all of that. This is putting a lot of pressure on them. So this is the area in which we have uh, some, some concern as far as uh, the intervention of the central bank is concerned. Right. Um, I think I have enough time to use, throw in one question um, to Bismarck before we go to the governor. Um, Bismarck, I want to hear your thoughts about your expectations for the economy moving forward. Now, clearly, there, I think there is that unanimous feel that re recession is inevitable. In fact, some will suggest that it's already happening. But um, what are your expectations in terms of how quickly we bounce back from this? I think in the early days, uh, should I say uh, um, late March, there was a sense that, you know, yes, there will be a recession and we'll quickly bounce back. But I think as everyone began to see the extent of the lockdown globally and, of course, its impact, some are now suggesting that perhaps that, that, pro, that um, economic slowdown could, be, um, could drag a little longer. Yes. And what are your, your thoughts on that? My expectations are simple. You see, the components of GDP are government, consumption, uh, net exports, and investment. What you are seeing, and Muda said it just now, the impact is not there. The total loans of 15 trillion naira in a 147 trillion naira economy is 10%. The total intervention so far, both central bank and the fiscal authorities, maximum is two or three trillion naira. Three trillion naira, 1% of, of GDP is 1.4 trillion. 2% of GDP is, uh, three trillion or four trillion. Now, compare that to the US where they are using $3 trillion stimulus package in a $22 trillion economy. 
15% of GDP. So you need, for you to feel the impact, you need to have something much more significant. Having said that, let me come back to the question. You, we are not going to have a V-shaped recovery. We are going to have a U-shape. That is the, the economy will come, go all the way down, flat line for a while, and then begin to come up quite sharply because we are going to be dealing with our pre-existing condition as an economy, at the same time dealing with the uh, COVID uh, crisis situation. So I, I think that you know, now that the price of oil uh, projection at an average of $35 a barrel, which is way ahead of what the budget benchmark is. But government spending and government investment, even on palliatives, will not solve the fundamental uh, existing condition of the Nigerian economy. That has to be done. That has to be dealt with, with the pricing uh, of the fact, which, you know, uh, which uh, both mainly fiscal. And uh, I say that the incentives that will make Nigerians invest domestically, make Nigerians in diaspora, bring their money back in here, yeah, 